calls me Jay, and I am really quite thrilled to be uh, here interviewing um, John Easterling, Amazon John. And together, I think we're going to put together the blue and the green. I, I, I tend to think about water a lot. I know John thinks about plants and forests a lot, but I, he's a water lover and I'm a plant lover. So we have a lot in common. We have a lot to talk about. Um, let me give you John's bio because it's, it's impressive. Uh, since 1976, John's been an explorer and treasure hunter in the Amazon rainforest. That's kind of like your dream job as a kid, uh, along with marine biologist, I suppose. It was there after he had a personal health crisis. He was introduced to the traditional use of medicinal plants by the indig indigenous people in Peru. Uh, since then, his passion for plant medicine has only accelerated, both personally and professionally. Uh, his original degree is in environmental studies, just like mine. He founded the Amazon uh, Herb Company in 1990, and he's on the board of the Amazon Center of Environmental Education and Research. So he's involved in all kinds of things. Uh, Amazon John's 28 years of plant medicine experience have been profiled on TV and radio and obviously podcasts, and I'm sure all over uh, the internet and, and other formats, uh, including Good Morning America and Fox and Friends. His product formulations have sold over $100 million of product worldwide, which is just amazing. And think of all the healing that's happened uh, through those products. John's been featured in two PBS docuseries, uh, World News Report, uh, a, a report called Amazon John and Rainforest Medicines, and Jean-Michel Cousteau, my, my dear friend's uh, show called Return to Amazon. I remember, I remember that, actually. <laughs> Easterling be believes the dramatic growth and in interest in plant medicine is still in its early stages and will continue to significantly improve life experiences and healthy outcomes into the future. And that's where my interest and John's interest overlap tremendously. I, I completely agree. Uh, there are so many healing modes, tools, modalities, uh, ideas available to us that are so incredibly underutilized. So uh, it's wonderful and fascinating uh, already to be on, on here with you, John, and love that you're connecting um, plant medicine and the, the needs of, of people so, so deeply. So we're going to jump right into this conversation. Got a bunch of questions, got a whole bunch of questions that have been submitted and uh, ready, ready to roll. But first, I want to ask you, I know you're kind of a, a water dog yourself and you have a love of water. What's, I always ask everyone, what's your water? What's your, what's the water you dream of that you first fell in love with? Uh, it's, it's the ocean, Jay. And I am a, I am a water dog and people <laughs> you know, bring that up because I just, I just salivate when I get close to the ocean. We've got a little apartment in Jupiter, Florida that's right on the ocean. And you're really beautiful, like Caribbean blue uh, water there. And ever since I was a kid, it's always been always been like that. So I've been certified multiple times in scuba diving, and and um, you know the water to me is almost like a home. Uh, when I get in water, there's a few things I really enjoy about it. It's like anti gravity, you know, the the gravitational pull it just goes away, and you're you're floating, and that alone is just so relaxing. And, and deep and healing and, and it's like you know the, the mother mother ocean is kind of surrounding you and it's secure and it's safe and um i love the ocean because i feel like i'm getting a really good mineral exchange you know our skin mm -hmm. is our largest organ and, and we're getting uh, minerals and trace minerals from the ocean there i don't get any place else and I, I spend 15 minutes, just 15 minutes in the water each morning when I'm in Florida or anywhere close to the water. <laughs> and uh, I come out and I'm charged for the day. Uh, I tend to be solar charged and water ocean charged. And I love it so much that when, when we do our conferences back with Amazon Earth Company, we have several hundred people come together. I wanted them to get into the water too. So I'd always have an oceanfront hotel someplace and early in the morning, I would gather everybody on the beach and actually pay them to get in the water. I had a program <laughs> called Splash for Cash. And so, uh, and all of, our, uh, all of our personnel were on the beach and you had to have a wet bathing suit. You had to prove that you actually got in. It wasn't hanging out on the beach. It was getting in that water 
And then when you came out, you got a little coupon, you know, that was good for, uh, for trading in for some herbage or something. And, and those days uh, that started like that were so much more productive and the, it changed everyone's attitude uh, about it. So, no, I'm 100% in alignment with, uh, with everything you're about to, in this regard. Yeah, connecting the blue and the green is so important. And, you know, I, I, I feel you on that. Um, the experience of, of conferencing when, you're, when you know you're going to spend the day in a room with a group of people working hard and, and working with big ideas, there's really no better way to start it or even end the day than jumping in the water. And uh, even if you have to bribe people, right? <laughs> it's, it's <still> <laughs> even if you pay them. <laughs> I got a much better response when I did that, but then they appreciated it, and then that would all pile in the next day. Yeah, exactly. We get once you get it started, they're reminded of something they maybe always knew going back to childhood. But so you've been working in the Amazon for let's say for about forty years. Um, what? So you you love the ocean, you love the water. Home is Jupiter Beach. What keeps pulling you back to the Amazon? I know there's water there too, but it's more than the river. It's it's the plants, it's the green space, it's the, uh, yeah. all, of, all of what you're learning there. But let's talk about that a bit. 40 years in the Amazon is, is quite impressive. Yeah, the, yeah, the Amazon is, uh, rainforest is kind of unique in, in the sense that it's the, like the highest concentration of, of life energy on Earth. You know, you have 100,000 species of plants growing there. And mm -hmm. only about 3% have been really looked at from a Western model of science for the therapeutic value but about a quarter of all pharmaceuticals come from that. So everyone knows there's concentrations of chemistry, of nutritional factors, of energetics in that rainforest that have extraordinary uh, health benefits. And the water in the Amazon, I didn't know it, but you know, uh, Celine Cousteau, when we were doing a documentary down in the return of the Amazon, she uh, uh, told me something that I didn't know, which was that the Amazon River has more species of fish in it than all the world's oceans combined. And wow. I thought that was really uh, 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 shocking, you know, to me, surprising, but then not surprising. Mm -hmm. So I guess just the concentration of life there, uh, being kind of an explorer and uh, a, a treasure hunter, you know, I mean, the medicinal plant treasure is, is just really, really deep inventory. Yeah. I, um, Good friends with Celine as well. She wrote she wrote the forward uh, to my book, so uh, we'll have to we'll have to get together the three of us at some point. But she so you you have this perspective on the Amazon that from forty years of exploring there and looking for ways for people to take better care of themselves, so that lots of pharmaceutical companies have gone to the Amazon in search of the you know the new miracle drug or you know, something to extract. How, how is what you do different and distinct from that sort of, that bio prospect, pro prospecting that um, we, we hear about so much from the pharmaceutical companies? Yeah, boy, I, I really appreciate that question, Jay, because that's, uh, I think, imperative for people's understanding of what uh, we have access to that uh, is not accessible through pharmaceuticals because the, the drug companies exploring around I give like two quick examples. In uh, Brazil, you've got a couple of plants, Pedro Macapa, Pede Baca, and they're very commonly used there as a hot water infusion and a tea for lowering blood uh, sugar. Okay, they're very effective, been used for a long time. And so obviously that's a multi-billion dollar market with diabetes. So the drug companies you know, have gotten these plants and so their idea is to run specific assays to see, okay, what is the active ingredient? You know, where is the active ingredient that they could get into a patentable form to fit their business model? And when they did that, they find seven ingredients there, seven particular compounds, but none of them worked. They had to all be together. So it really frustrated them because they can't make a drug out of it because they're dealing with the reductionist isolate model that, that would fit their commercial activity so they know what the plant does. And then when you take the hot water, the, the leaves and put them in hot water, make a tea, hot water infusion, it works every time. Mm -hmm. So a little frustrating to them, but that's available, but that's why it doesn't fit that, that channel and why it's wonderful that we have it available. 
Uh, the challenge is that we can't say, hey, this is good for diabetes. We can talk about it supporting a normal pancreas function. So you really have to have a little bit more of an educated consumer, but the material is there, the material is available. Sangre de Drago, another fantastic example, it's the sap from the croton, the cherry tree. You whack this tree with the machete and it bleeds its blood, blood red. And it's uh, traditionally been used for wound healing. It stimulates the uh, fibroblast cells and the migration of those cells to heal wounds. And then they also found that it was uh, very potent by dry weight. It's 90% pure proanthocyanidin, so it's an extraordinary antioxidant. And then they discovered it was very antiviral, and particularly uh, in, in disrupting the uh, herpes simplex virus. And that's a, you know, also a you know, mega billion dollar uh, target. So there's a drug company that uh, spent you know, $5 million to isolate those compounds to, to make a drug. I wasn't able to do it, but they saw what the SAP did. So they stayed with it. They partnered with another drug company because they were running short on resources. Ultimately, they spent almost $30 million before they finally gave up because the more isolate compounds that were patentable uh, became toxic and, and unusable. So they finally had to abandon that. But they proved again, you know, how valuable, uh, like in this case, the sap of the, of the dragon's blood or uh, Sangre de Drago uh, tree is. And the beautiful thing about it, Jay, is that we have access to those compounds. Now we can't say, you know, this is an antiviral and this is good for herpes. Uh, you know, we can say it's a, it's a very potent antioxidant. So people have to do a little research and a little education and that information is, is easily available, you know, now, uh, yeah. you know, you just uh, Google around and access that. So the good news is we have access to these compounds that are in our inner environment, have a profile of chemistry and a profile of energetics and a, a profile of, of nutrients that are simply not available in our normal diets. And when our bodies uh, receive that, they automatically, we don't have to think about it, they automatically uh, say, hey, look at these compounds. I've never had access to this before. Now I can go to another level. And so the heart, spleen, thymus, pancreas, liver, you know, all the organs just gravitate to a new level because they have a new source of nutrition and, and chemistry. So that's the, that's the really good news. Yeah, well, that's a, and it's a familiar story throughout, I, you know, I can think throughout my, my life that, you know, every, every few years there's a new, it's not, a, you know, they call them miracle foods or wonder foods, whatever you want to call it. But every few years we, we're introduced to something that, holds up to scrutiny and, and is introduced into our diets here in the U.S. Um, and, I, you know, you can just remember throughout, I mean, we, went from, we went from white bread and bologna sandwiches and Kool-Aid when I was a kid. <laughs> to, like we're eating, we're eating quinoa and brown rice and all kinds of good stuff. And it's medicine. I mean, it is medicine for our bodies to eat food that that's actually has the right kind of chemistry for, you know, health, to support health. And also to heal us. So it's really fascinating to, to listen to. But how, so how do you, you're surrounded by so much biodiversity in the Amazon rainforest. Uh, just it's, you know, it's this, the world capital of biodiversity on land. How do you decide where to put your focus, what uh, plants to farm and which ones to deliver to the, the people who need their healing properties or their nutritional properties? Yeah, well, you're right, Jay. I mean, there's so much there. I mean, what do you what do you do with this gigantic treasure? So, really, is demand driven? When we look at uh, and for for many years, you know, back in the early '90s, I sold exclusively to doctors. So the doctors uh, were calling, saying, "Listen, I've got a group of patients that have this, and I've got a group that have this." And so, as we began to formulate specifically to that, that's what's driving which plants we were accessing. You know, reaching into the treasure house and saying, okay, let's look at these things. And over a period of time, like three years with, with doctors all over the country, it became very clear that people everywhere were dealing with pretty much the same kind of issues. There was immune system dysfunction, inefficient digestion, inefficient uh, metabolism, energy circulation, uh, calming stress-related issues, hormonal balancing, uh, pain, swelling, inflammation, these were, you know, uh, environmental toxicity, you know, liver kidney support. 
So those probably addressed about 90% of what everyone was, was looking uh, to address, which were all kind of degenerative and, you know, and environmentally induced issues uh, because we're all living in a similar environment, have a similar metabolism and, and similar exposures. So we just focused on those areas uh, just from a demand standpoint, then we can look into our, our treasure chest and say, okay, what is, what is available here mm -hmm. that can uh, help restore someone back to a to state of balance? So a lot of what you're doing sounds new to the average North American. You know, it's maybe seems very foreign or it's a new language in, in some literally and figuratively. But as you get closer to the source of these plants, you, you see that there's, there's ancient local knowledge uh, in the communities where these, these plants grow naturally, uh, perhaps throughout Peru, throughout the Amazon region, there's more knowledge as you get closer. Is that, does, that, does that kind of hold up? That, does that make sense as far as the local knowledge and the local use uh, of these plants that you're working with? Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, if you're, if you're looking uh, to address uh, an issue, Let's, let's ask the people that live in that treasure house, you know, that's the, that's your first uh, bet because they're using things, you know, they've discovered things from many, many generations of, of use and trial and error. And then that gives you a, a really good starting point. And because uh, I've been going into different parts of, of, of the Amazon, uh, you know, so there's certain plants that are used, for example, for uh, liver health. In, uh, along, along one river system, and then a thousand miles away, it's still in the rainforest, there's other plants. You know, you have another uh, uh, population of plants that are growing and people are using something else. So then we have to look at, okay, maybe these two work together. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Maybe it's, you know, 5% of that, 95% of that. Maybe there's another synergistic plant. So we had some technology and still do that we're able to look at those plants and actually see how how this material is going to interface with the human physiology, you know, before it's consumed. And then we, you know, formulate and allow consumption like in a clinic setting for a period of time to see if that's uh, actually what takes place. But yeah, actually starting with that indigenous knowledge and then uh, going into the databases because it's surprising uh, how, how much uh, information and research has been done on these plants in one part of the world or another now is all what used to be very segregated information databases that you, you didn't know what was happening in Japan, which is where I am right now, or you didn't know what was happening in, uh, in Hungary. You didn't know somebody in Russia had studied this plant at university and uh, China had researched this. And then when you're able to get that, you're able to confirm what's happening. And uh, like, like Shanka Piedra is a great one. They gave that to me. I had, I had hepatitis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and they just looked at me, went off in the bush, collected some, uh, when they got to Shanka Piedra and started feeding me these teas. And I had no expectation back then. I was, I was hunting, you know, I was, I was trading in uh, blow guns and uh, bones and artifacts and things like that. And, but it turned my life around. And then when I started looking at the research on it, I see like the Shanka Piedra uh, has a reverse transcriptase inhibition effect, which means it interferes with viruses' ability to replicate. And that was my uh, issue, you know, with the hepatitis back then. How did, how did they know, you know? Uh, no, they didn't say this has a reverse transcriptase inhibition effect. They just knew that plant would help me. And it's uh, very well recognized for removing excess calculi. Kidney stones, I've never, I've never seen it. I've never seen it fail, actually. Uh, for uh, dissolving kidney stones, but all that calculi, those stones build up in the ducts of the liver, and then virus will tend to colonize around that. So getting rid of that and breaking up the virus is really replicate. So yeah, you start with the indigenous knowledge and then go from there, and, and then you're able to kind of substantiate some history behind how that's been, what maybe the mechanisms of activity of that plant, and then of course actually formulating and putting it into a population to see if that's uh, what happens with real time, real people. Well, you've really seen the evolution of, of this space over the past four decades, I'm sure. And the, you know, the, you just mentioned the technology, so let's just call it 20 years ago, our ability to communicate with like-minded people all over the world in a matter of milliseconds has transformed 
the way we share share this knowledge and and accelerate the research and see what's working. Um, one of the trends I've I've seen and been involved in myself is is the um, sort of the rise in interest in brain health in our uh, how our nervous system works, um, our, the science of emotion. Um, you mentioned stress, anxiety, depression, burnout is getting a lot of attention these days. People are just feeling burnt out from work, from life. Um, dementia and Alzheimer's are getting a lot of attention. A recent study just came out that showed the linkage between viruses and bacteria and Alzheimer's. So really break through you know, Western science that seems to me like it's pointing right to the things you're just talking about. If you've got some plants that can help uh, treat bacteria and viral infections, perhaps, I'm, I'm a little bit out of my, my league here, but perhaps that could be implicated in um, a, a remedy that I have to be real careful here, but uh, Let's talk about Alzheimer's and dementia and how your work intersects there and with brain health. Yeah, no, no, you're, you know, you're just, you're just going down a very rational uh, train of thought and it's, it's really uh, spot on. So they talk about the virus and the bacteria as being potentially causative factors to some of the early issues going on there. And in fact, uh, uh, yeast and candida uh, was just uh, singled out, especially the uh, uh, candida albicon uh, yeast, uh, if the brain issue. I mean, we know uh, that so many people, pretty good chunk of the population has this, you know, candida. The reason being that most of our generation grew up eating a whole bunch of antibiotics, and many people still do. It's a lot of antibiotics, so it wipes out the, the majority of the microbiome in the gut. And it makes it a very uh, uh, wonderful place for this yeast to multiply. And it, the yeast just doesn't stay in the gut. We know that the yeast is systemic. So it'll go throughout the, the entire body. And previously, it was thought that that uh, candida could not cross the blood-brain barrier. Mm. And recent research shows that it actually can and, and does. And so that's a big chunk of the population. So that's considered an, an insult uh, to the to the brain and some of the other uh, issues some of the general factors are like inflammation we know if you have an inflammatory uh, uh, you know biological terrain in your body that's very friendly to many pathogenic uh, processes and it's a big thing with brain uh, brain health uh, Alzheimer's and dementia as well and then specifically with Alzheimer's and dementia you have amyloid placking and you have uh, tau tangles uh, being, being involved. So I, I kind of liken it to a, uh, the old spark plugs uh, in, in uh, cars and lawnmowers and everything like that. And, you, and it used to be you could open the hood and see your engine and see the spark plugs and go in there and, you know, and change them. And so that spark plug, we had a little gap where the spark jumps over you know, after in, in our nervous system's kind of the same way. You've got a lot of neurons and dendrites in the synoptic cleft, the space in between where, you know, the energy is generated and puts a little spark across to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. So I want to know where my car keys are. You know, boom, it goes down there, finds my car keys, goes, accesses that data, <laughs> brings it back, boom. But like a spark plug, as these things get gonked up, you know, say with the amyloid plaque, then that doesn't work then uh, your engine is misfiring and you're not accessing that data. So being able to try to break down that amyloid placking or prevent its, uh, you know, these deposits and that formation to begin with uh, is something of particular interest in a lot of the, uh, the research. And then there are these fibrils uh, as part of that. And, and, and these fibrils, you have these tangles, they call them, I think, tau uh, tangles where that information is not being efficiently processed through, so you're not accessing your data again. And there's some, there's some great botanicals for that. For example, uh, cat's claw uh, is um, it's called a brain-derived neurotropic factor. And what that means is that it just helps facilitate this process of, uh, uh, of breaking down that plaque, but also to regenerate uh, our brain cells. You know, every cell in our body, are, we're always having, you know, cells die off. It's a normal cycle. Cells that have a, have a 
life cycle and die and other cells are, are born and are created and, and come on. So the idea is if you're creating more cells than the ones that are dying off, then you know, you're in good shape. So it's Riley's Botanicals that facilitate, I mean, from brain derived neurotrophic factor, where you're helping to create new cells and there's some other botanicals uh, here that have uh, compounds like cinnabaldehyde and, and cinnamon, for example, actually uh, slows down the uh, apoptosis or the natural death cycle of some of the other cells. So you get more growing, you're slowing down the ones that are dying. And so you're actually building brain mass. And I, I don't think there's any reason why we should accept this uh, notion that as we get older, the brain goes in a state of decline Yes, it's very common, but that doesn't mean it's normal. Or that doesn't mean there's not things that we can do about it uh, because we know that we, that we can. And so you're, you're, you've taken some of these ingredients and you've worked with our friends at Organics and you've formulated a brain health product out of your knowledge, um, these plants, with the goal of, of helping people perhaps stave off some of these diseases or disorders, uh, perhaps even reverse some of them to some degree. Uh, let's talk about that a bit, because that's, that's kind of where the rubber hits the road. And if you've got, you've got all this knowledge, all this insight, you've got these, these plants being grown, these, um, chem this, the chemistry being extracted, and how do we get it in our, into our, our lives is kind of the, the question, right? And how do we do that in the best possible way? Yeah, and like, you know, uh, just pointing to one of your original questions, you know, how, how do you choose what you're going to put together and like they say, demand driven. So right now, uh, you know, Alzheimer's and dementia is a very big issue, you know, with the aging population. And there really isn't uh, very good uh, results happening in the, in the current um, uh, systems. In fact, you know, like one out of three uh, deaths, uh, people over 65 is related to Alzheimer's and dementia. Mm -hmm. Over the past 10 years with cardiovascular health, uh, with a lot of breakthroughs and things going on there, the number of deaths to that has actually declined 11%, but the number of deaths to Alzheimer and dementia has increased 120%. So it's really moving off the chart. Um, I'm at this conference here with a bunch of really uh, extraordinary researchers and, and forward thinkers. And there was a gentleman here uh, from Australia. He's a laureate professor in neurology in Australia. And uh, this, is his, this is his whole life and his passion. And, he, the, you know, and it's just very, very difficult. He's working on a, a, a blood test you know, for early detection of Alzheimer's and dementia, but as far as an actual efficacious uh, uh, a, a product in the pharmaceutical industry, he's already spent you know, not only hundreds of millions, but billions of dollars because it's such a big target market, but with, with such poor success that many of them are just withdrawing. They're coming out of that space. They just can't spend that much money over and over again and not get anywhere. And they're going into other areas uh, of research and study with other issues. So the actual amount of, of dollars and research from that group going into this is actually contracting because they've been so frustrated with little success. And one of the reasons that, that I think, and it's just my thinking, is because it goes back to the model where you're looking at one of those causative factors and, and making an isolate that may be good for that, that's not gonna be good enough to get the job done. You really need mm -hmm. to address uh, the several things, you know, the tau tangles, the amyloid plaque, and the inflammatory issues, uh, the other issues like, you know, uh, the various kinds of, of uh, viral and bacterial load and yeast and fungus. And when you do that in a multiplicity of way, kind of an entourage uh, approach to it, I think that's where we're really going to get the benefit. And that's just not the model uh, that, that's out there. So this provides a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful space. And what we can say, of course, you know, we know, we know what we're talking about here with Alzheimer's and dementia and things like that. And we're not, so what we can say about this product in the space that we're in, in the environment, regulatory environment we're in, is an age-related cognitive decline. So that's kind of what we're addressing with, with creating a non-inflammatory 
uh, space in the brain and the rest of the body. So there's other benefits one would get from this, this product uh, besides for the brain because it's going to address the inflammatory terrain in your whole body. Uh, Podiarco is very antifungal, anti-candida uh, 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 botanical. It's also got the immune properties, you know, and antibacterial properties. Uh, Sangre Drago, I talked about a little earlier, is part of this uh, formula, which is uh, a very potent source of antioxidant. And you get, you know, oxidative process started in the, in the, in the brain, the rest of the body. So you can help uh, normalize and reverse that. And uh, Bacopa, Bacopa is a uh, plant that's got a lot of really good studies on it around, uh, you know, cognition, improving cognition, improving memory. And the other benefit from, from doing all this, oh, and a Wayusa. Uh, Wayusa is, uh, I've got a lot of uh, in it. And uh, so it really uh, facilitates um, uh, immune support, antioxidant activity, camu camu, the polyphenols, uh, the vitamin C, quercetin, resveratrol, or specific compounds in there that have been studied for uh, uh, cognitive decline. And so once you, you know, combine all of those things uh, together and they all have a commonality of being uh, really good for the issues we're talking about here with improved cognition and uh, memory, you've, uh, you know, that's, that's just the direction that we've gone. And, and we're really pleased with what we're seeing happen with that. And for a human being, you know, the, you know, not when you're correcting that, then people become more comfortable in social settings. You know, they're more <laughs> confident because as you're speaking and you're forgetting what you're saying, or you can't remember the numbers, or you can't remember the names, or you can't remember the dates or the events, or you're telling a story, then, whoa, you can't, you can't remember, you know, how that story flows. People will begin to withdraw. And, and then as they regain that, you know, they're confident again in social situations and interacting with people. And that's really, you know, ultimately what we like to see. Yeah, it's quality of life and, and really taking this whole person approach to, to health and wellness rather than, you know, maybe the old, the old and hopefully fading away approach of just really isolating every disease, illness and disorder down to these small boxes and treating it, you know, in this micro sort of way, taking a step back and, and, and blending some of these approaches. So combining, you know, neurological brain health with you know, anti-inflammatory properties and so on. I, I think it's, it's brilliant. Hopefully this is truly the future. I, I have one, one thing I want to touch on before we end here. And it's kind of a little, a little bit of a shift, but we, we started talking about our mutual love of water and how uh, just being in the water can be uh, like medicine for us. And it can be refreshing, restoring. It wakes you up better than a cup of coffee. It hits the big reset button. It clears out the cobwebs. Uh, for some people, it's a very romantic setting. Uh, it connects you to the people that you're with, sometimes facilitates conversation. All the, all the things that we make pills for, but it's just it's called the ocean. Or it's called the river. There's this concept called forest bathing, which is, I think is interesting. The word bathing is interesting because it's an aquatic word, but essentially forest bathing is, is what you do when you're in the Amazon forest is you're, you're walking on trails, you're hiking, hiking through these forests, you're looking around, you're, all of your senses are, are stimulated in a way that's also restorative and relaxing. So it's kind of like you're being bathed in plants in a sense. And I just wanted to bring that up because forest bathing has gotten a lot of attention. And I think combined with a regular swim in the ocean or lake or river and plant-based medicines uh, just sounds like the, really the, the best recipe for, for health and wellness that we've got. And maybe the oldest as well. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I think it's a really good match. And I'm just, I'm just glad I hadn't met anyone before you that's really focusing on that whole area of why why the water is so important is really, you know, being in the water or near the water thing. And he's talking about me. You may not <laughs> like that out there. 
And so, yeah, in the, in the Amazon, we've got the Amazon River, and that's, uh, you know, that's full of sediment. You can't see anything, so it's always a little spooky, but hey, you got to get in, you know. Yeah. you got to get in, and then you're feeling little things and nibbling on you, and you know, there's a lot of other things in there, too. There's a lot of life force and a lot of energy in that. Um, I was thinking I did a, a seminar in um, Hawaii many years ago, and went to like you know, five different islands. And so I insisted on getting in the water and on each of the islands, even though we we're only there in the morning and do the seminar. And then we're leaving in the late afternoon. I'd stop on the way to the airport. So I just wore my bathing suit the whole time. I was on those planes with a wet bathing suit, but you know, that's Hawaii, so it's okay. But I had to get in the water. I love to uh, feel you know, that experience because it's different. You know, the oceans are different than the rivers and you get a little different feeling. But uh, it's a winner every time. And I've seen that happen with other people too. People who didn't maybe have an appreciation for the water until you know you talk to them about your experience and it just opened their eyes like, okay, I've never thought about it like that. And when they get in, they recognize, you know, the real value in it. And it does, it like clears the, I think it clears the auric field and you just get charged and you're good for the whole day. Yeah, you're right. I, I love starting a conversation with that simple question. What's your water? What's the water you love? And people will go right back maybe to the water of their childhood and you just see their eyes get bright and they start pulling up the nostalgia and the memories. And it's, it's always a, a great way to, to start a conversation. So whenever you're sitting on an airplane or just turn to the person next to you and say, hey, what's your water? Tell me your water story. And, and it's going to be a good one almost every time. Yeah. yeah. Well, John, thanks so much. An honor and a pleasure to, to chat with you. And, and uh, I feel like we could, um, we could just stay here for weeks on end and, and, uh, and keep talking about um, all the knowledge that you have that's so incredibly useful and our mutual love of, of water and, and some of our shared uh, beloved friends and experiences and places. But um, we're going to wrap it up here with... Uh, with that and once again thanks so much for for chatting and sharing what yeah. you know yeah thank you jay look forward to getting together and uh and having a splash with you let's do it <laughs> maybe in florida when you're back in jupiter beach <laughs> be august yep right on see you there right to right.